For tonight's debates, we have very strict rules in place. To protect our staff, to protect the candidates on stage, we're making sure that all of our crew has masks and everyone coming in the door has to show proof of vaccination. To make this night possible, as unusual as it may be, we relied on a number of our community partners, closest of which, of course, is the Somerville Chamber of Commerce helping us produce this event. Thank you to the Somerville Theatre and the Freeman family for this beautiful space we're in tonight. And of course, for you watching at home. I hope you vote, and let's go watch the debate. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we'll be uh, listening to a lot of voices. The voices that we'll be hearing are candidates for the at-large positions on the City Council of the City of Somerville. My name is Judy Perlman. I'll be moderating tonight's panel. We're going to have a fairly structured format. We're going to have opening statements. We're going to have closing statements. The most interesting part of this will be a lot of engagement, questioning back and forth uh, among the candidates. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our candidates, each of whom will have one minute to make their opening statement. Eve Sychik, please lead us off. All right. Well, my name is Eve Sychik. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a community organizer, a trans feminine non-binary person, and a democratic socialist organizer. Uh, I'm running because I believe that the power to make Somerville better is in the hands of regular people. And I think every time we listen to the activists and advocates in our, our community who are fighting for disability justice or housing justice, sustainability, our tree canopy, or even just to deal with the rats, we make the city a little bit better. And instead, when we try to split the difference between the interests of regular people in the city and big developers and corporate landlords and their fancy lawyers who have their own proposals for what our future should look like and see dollar signs when they see the future of development in Somerville, we miss an opportunity to make our city amazing. And I'm going to fight every day as your city councilor to make Somerville a place that works for everyone, not just the wealthy and well-connected. Now we'll hear from Virginia Hussey. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for allowing us to be here today. Um, so again, my name is Virginia Hussey. I'm running for our council at large because I believe in Somerville. Um, I was born and raised here. This is my home. Um, I've gone through a lot of the stuff that our platforms um, are. I have a 10 year old son as well. Um, and I do a lot with the, the youth programs. Um, I've also been in the union, um, I'm a union member, Local 17, and have fought for the unions with some will stands together at rallies and even at the state house um, with the testimony. And I've been doing this for years and now I just wanna do it on a bigger platform. I wanna be the voice for some of old people, all of them, not the rich, not the poor, everybody. Um, our city is so divided right now and I think that we need to come together as one um, in order to do what's right and what's good for some of all. Um, so I want to say thank you um, and vote for me on November 2nd. And now we'll hear from Willie Burnley. Thank you to the Somerville Media Center for having us. Hello, my name is Willie Burnley Jr. I'm a queer community organizer, a renter, a former union steward, um, running alongside many of our local movements in order to march the demands of our community into City Hall. As someone who faced displacement years ago when my rent went up several hundred dollars, I know firsthand the kind of anxiety and fear that is running through our community right now amongst our neighbors who are struggling to pay the bills and to stay in this community. But we have a choice in this election. We can continue down the path of becoming a community where only millionaires can buy homes and where renters are getting displaced. or we can fight to make sure that Somerville is more affordable, accountable, and accessible to everybody, and to make sure that the people who want to stay in this community can afford to do so. As your city councilor, I will fight to do the latter. So I hope if you want to make a difference in this uh, community, that you vote for me on November 2nd. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Jake Wilson. Hi, I'm Jake Wilson. Uh, thanks to the Somerville Media Center and uh, for hosting this and to Judy for moderating. Uh, I'm excited to be here uh, up on stage with a, a great group of people. Uh, and I'm excited to be part of a change election in Somerville. 
uh, our city government's going to look pretty different come uh, January from what it's looked like uh, in, in recent years. And I think it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, we're running a positive issue focused campaign here. Uh, we're looking to tackle some of these big problems uh, that face our city, everything from affordability to equity to basic livability issues. Uh, I, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can tackle regional issues much in the, at the same time that we tackle the things that are unique to Somerville. Uh, I'm a worker. Uh, I'm a, a data-driven person who, uh, who enjoys finding solutions to problems. And uh, I hope you give me a chance to do that for the people of Somerville. Uh, I ask for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Tracy Leah Pratt. Thank you, Judy. Good evening, fellow candidates, and good evening, Somerville. My name is Tracy Leah Pratt. I'm running for city council here in Somerville. I'm an educator, an advocate, and a game changer. November 2nd is election day, and you get four votes for city council at large. I hope to be one of those votes. My vision for Somerville is a city that's equi equitable and inclusive for all people in everything that our great city has to offer. I believe in the possibility of a police department that's going to partner with the community and specifically those who are most vulnerable and underserved. I believe in a city where residents have adequate housing. And I also believe in a city in, in the future of our children, which is this city. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Charlotte Kelly. Hi, I'm Charlotte Kelly. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a queer fourth generation resident, a renter, and I've been a community organizer for the past almost 10 years now. I was first politicized when I had to take out student loans in order to attend a public university here in the state of Massachusetts. And my classmates came to me and said, you know, Charlotte, public education wasn't always as expensive. We could organize. And I haven't stopped since. I came back to Somerville, helped get Senator Pat Jalen reelected as her 2016 field director. And then most recently was the executive director of a statewide community labor coalition that with thousands of parents, teachers, and students, won a $1.5 billion increase in public school funding. I'm particularly going to communities like Somerville that educate high percentages of low-income students, students of color, and immigrant students. So when the at-large council seats began opening up this election cycle, folks that I'd been organizing with for nearly a decade came to me and said, Charlotte, we want you to run. And I took their asks really seriously and said yes. I believe this election will transform our community and we have an opportunity to build a Somerville that'll work for all of us. Thanks for being here tonight. Now we'll hear from Kristen Strezzo. Hello. Hi everyone, I am Councilor Kristen Strezzo, one of your city councilors at large. So a little bit about me, I'm a single mom of two kids in, this, in the public school system. And for 12 years, I cared for my grandmother. She has had ADA accessibility issues. And finding a home that was affordable and accessible in our community was virtually impossible. We had to win a housing lottery. And I stepped up to serve in this community because I had the blessing of living in affordable housing. And I know there's so many more in our community that understand that struggle. And I am working to make sure that every resident feels the security, the dignity of safe, affordable housing. And I've done so much work together alongside you in our community. And I'm so excited to talk about what we're going to do in the future. Um, I'm, looking, getting, I'm looking forward to the work uh, and talking about the work in this. And I'm asking for your vote this November 2nd. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Justin Klakoda. Thank you for this opportunity. So my name is Justin Klakoda. For 20 years, I've been part of our community as a renter, homeowner, vaccine researcher, climate advocate, and your Democratic State Committee. It would be an honor to serve you as Rose's next city councilor at large. I grew up in a blue-collar community next to an affordable housing development, and I come from a proud union family. I understand the importance of affordable education, and I've committed my career to medical research and life-saving vaccines. For over 20 years, I've been part of our community in Somerville, and I've been part of some tough campaigns. During one, one election day, I was even physically threatened by an extremist who was intimidating voters, including people of color and members of the gay community, and I stood my ground. 
we've come a long way. And I am proud of our political transformation in Somerville. This time, we have the historic opportunity to transform our economy to be healthier, greener, and more fair. With your support, let's build that future together. Thank you. If you were elected, who would establish rent control in Somerville? Thank you. Who would vote to defund the police? Who among you would advocate for a fair, free um, MBTA? How do you feel about universal pre-kindergarten for Somerville residents? And finally, who here would back Green New Deal legislation? Thank you all very much. So let's debate. Here's how it's going to work. Each candidate will have two chances to do this. We'll circle through twice. And the candidate whom I will designate will ask a question of any other candidate. You have 30 seconds to read out your question or to, to, to pose your question. A candidate to whom you're addressing yourself will have one minute to respond. If you've invoked the positions or the name of another candidate in a meaningful way, that candidate will also get 30 seconds to respond. If you don't answer the question, I'm kind of going to jump on you. I'm going to say, okay, that was very interesting, but could you please go back and answer the question? This is a time for um, really putting our, our positions and our... our uh, ourselves on the line. So if you're wandering away, trust me, I'll try to bring you back. So here we go. Again, 30 seconds for the question, one minute for the answer. Here we go, starting into our rotation. Charlotte Kelly, would you please go ahead and ask your first question? Sure. Um, my question is directed to Eve Sidecheck. So I've seen your palm cards all around town. So you're clearly doing a lot of door knocking, just like everybody else on this stage. And obviously when we're on the doors, we get lots and lots of answers from constituents about what they want to see here in our community. What are some of the most bread and butter issues you hear when you talk to voters on the doors? Oh, well, thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, and I, you know, being a candidate, it's an exciting time to go and talk to people about the issues that are affecting their everyday lives. And uh, you hear a lot, but there are always those themes that come up. I think for me, the issues I hear the most about are people want something to be done about the rats, and they're always surprised that maybe we only have one city employee who's primarily tasked with that. And that's something we can change. Um, they're interested in hearing about uh, why their basement floods every time there is a big storm. I was walking around Duck Village with Councillor JT Scott, and people are angry. And they want the tens of millions of dollars of investment in upgrading our 120-year-old sewer system uh, that we need to have a livable city. And they're excited about that, even though uh, some of those investments will take decades to complete. Because people in Somerville really understand that they're here for the long term if they're able to stay, and uh, they want us to help them make that happen. Um, I also hear a lot about upgrading school buildings and many other issues, and I'm excited to take those on as a counselor. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now ask Virginia Hussey to pose a question to another candidate. Okay, well, thank you. So my question will be for, for Willie. Um, if your constituents do not agree with what your agenda is, are you able to put your feelings or judgments aside and do what's right for the community? Thank you, Virginia, for that question. Um, as a resident of this city, I've um, organized locally with a lot of different groups um, that work around housing justice, um, environmental justice, and racial justice. Um, from groups like Justice Somerville to United to CAS, um, Somerville Community Land Trust. And I know that there are a lot of different viewpoints in our city around a lot of different issues. There's not one part of this community that is monolithic in its standpoints. Um, and I respect as an organizer um, when people get together in mass and say, hey, you have the right idea in, or you don't have the right idea. Um, so I'm very receptive to hearing people out and being open minded. Um, but what I won't compromise on are my fundamental values that people need to be able to live in this city uh, for the long term, if, that 
Um, we deserve housing as a human right and that we need to fight to make this place more racially just. Thank you, Willie. Take a breath because now is your Oh, time. perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I will ask this question to Charlotte. Um, similarly to, I, I guess, um, a question I was just asked, um, there's a lot of different viewpoints on the council as well sometimes. Um, and with this very diverse set of um, candidates, there may be differing viewpoints around a lot of issues. So how will you um, work with, together with your fellow counselors um, as a deliberative body? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so when I was the executive director of a statewide education justice coalition, I had to bring together parent organizations, teachers unions, community groups, immigrant rights organizations to all collaborate and find shared solutions to our shared problems. Um, this often meant a lot of struggling over what we thought the end solutions were, what we thought our goals were going to be, what we thought needed to be prioritized in those moments. And as the facilitator, as the person who had to convene those folks um, and bring people together and recognize at the end of the day that we had more in common than we did different, um, it made our solutions and our shared goals stronger because we were able to disagree with each other with love. Um, we were able to struggle together on the real principle issues that we believed in fundamentally, and ultimately at the end of the day, we were able to build real solidarity and trust with one another. And so I see the council as necessitating that similar goal, working together for the greater good of the city of Somerville, and ultimately not compromising on our values of justice and dignity at the end of the day. Thank you. Kristen Streza, you can now ask your, that's your first question. Okay, sure. Um, is this on? Okay. My question is, uh, well, that's this one to Charlotte. Charlotte, how does your climate plan, um, uh, you speak of wanting to, to incorporate a, a Green New Deal, how does it differ exactly from the Somerville Stands Together plan and the Somerville Climate Action Plan, which have both been um, introduced? Yeah, I don't know if I would necessarily describe my plan as different. Um, as an organizer, I recognize that there are experts who understand these issues better than me. Um, I think the Somerville Stands Together plan, particularly the Shovel Ready plan, is really critical when it comes to getting good union jobs here in our community, making sure that we have local hiring, making sure that we set benchmarks for young people, for queer folks, for folks of color, for women, um, and at the end of the day that we're prioritizing building the kind of infrastructure that's necessary to address the climate catastrophe that's coming right now. Um, if we're going to build a municipal Green New Deal that invests in our streets, that invests in our water and sewage, that invests in our schools, it's going to take a massive overhaul of our budgetary priorities. It's going to take all hands on deck to build these types of projects. It's going to take input from local unions, um, from community organizations, from environmental mental justice groups and at the end of the day if there are plans like the shovel ready plan from the Somerville Stands Together Coalition ready to go I say we've got to move with them. Thank you. Jake Wilson your turn to pose your question. Thanks Judy. Uh, my question is for Tracy. Uh, Tracy I, I was really impressed with uh, your work with Just Us Somerville. I thought it came along right at the time when it was needed most. I've never seen white people listen to the extent that they did to, to just us. Uh, where do you see the organization going from here? Uh, so I too, I'm very proud of the organization. I will always say it is the most grassroots movement I've ever participated in because we did not plan to start an organization or a movement. It was just some folks that wanted to do an action and out of it grew Just Us Somerville. Um, the group right now, to be perfectly honest, I mean, the, everyone knows there are two of us on this stage right now. So we are very proud that out of that, there are some of us that are running for office are actually taking it to another step. Mm -hmm. So the others who are running, supporting, they're still very active. They might be supporting some of us or other candidates. Um, we are continuing to get other members and seek other members of color. And one thing that's very difficult in the city are making sure that people of color and the underserved feel proud enough or, or feel empowered enough to, to join a group. So that's where we are trying to recruit. Okay. 
once again, time to take a breath because it's now your turn. It's your friend to ask you a question. Okay. So my question is for Justin. Uh, Justin, you are quite the scientist, I would like to say, and I know that you have spoken about STEM and STEM education. Can you share a couple of ideas that you have for STEM education in Cambridge Public Schools? I'm sorry, in Somerville Public Schools. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you for your service as a teacher to our community. So I definitely feel that there are opportunities to expand our, not just our pre-K, but our after-school programs to include additional training opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, both in terms of coursework, but also in preparation for students transitioning to the workforce, noting that we are transitioning to a green economy that needs contractors who know how to deploy green technology, including heat pump systems. So I definitely feel there's an opportunity to increase funding for after-school programs. And we also need to take a more comprehensive view of education that also supports people throughout their life so they can actually uh, find jobs. And if we provide training for in-demand job skills at our new high school in the evenings for adults, you know, sometimes people are only one or two job skills away from landing that next job. And so we can actually help make increase employment in Somerville uh, by providing education support uh, their entire life. So, and there's hundreds of thousands of jobs in STEM that are unfilled every year. So if we do this, for our students in terms of after school and lifelong support, we can increase employment and equity in some of them. Thank you. Justin, it's your turn to ask a question. Great, uh, so my question is for Tracy. Um, this past summer, you led the boycott of the Our Revolution Somerville endorsement process in response to their decision to exclude Board Two Council candidate Stepson Amon, a son of Haitian immigrants. In your opinion, what is the role of diversity and inclusion in our democratic process and our government? Thank you for the question. So first of all, we have to learn to separate those terms. We put them together. We put diversity and inclusion together and we think that they're synonymous and they are not. Diversity, that's checking a box. That's saying, oh, we may need this many people of color. We may need that many people that have a disability to meet a quota. That's diversity. But the real issue is, is inclusion. How do you actually bring people in to the fold? How do you make people, everyone feel part of a group, whether it's part of the city that we're working towards, whether it's part of um, our political, uh, political landscape, here in the city. So the diversity is just one part, but we have to be able to work together and, and respect each other in order for all of us to be and feel included. Tracy, if I may, I'm gonna ask you to uh, dive a little bit more into the specific question that Justin posed to you. It had to do with an event some months ago. Can you just speak to what he raised? Um, I, yes, I can speak to, to that event. So, um, First of all, when I was approached with the news that that basically this particular candidate, um, there, there there seemed to be a move to lock him from being included into the ORS um, forum. So the first question that I asked the the group who did this action, the very first question that I asked was, is this about winning or is this about doing what's right? Because I'll do what's right even if I lose. Um, even if it costs me a campaign, I would do what's right. And everyone felt that this was about doing what's right. So I don't necessarily believe that this person was blocked because He's a Haitian son of immigrants. I don't think that he was blocked for that reason. But I do question if he was blocked because he wasn't the popular candidate. I have questions about that. I have questions about um, what makes organizations' views right and correct. One thing I'm very proud of is that the organization did decide to step back 
they decided to step to to review their um their their policies so if nothing else that's one thing that came out of it thank you very much really appreciate your um, Eve, it's your turn to pose your question. Sure, I have a question for Willie. Uh, so, yeah, I've looked at your literature, your platform. You have some really big ideas, and I think uh, well, questions on some people's mind, maybe mine, is you know, wh what are you going to do on the council to really fight for those and get those done in practice? Well, thank you for that question. You know, I do have some big ideas. I, I learned that working on um cinder elizabeth warren's re-election campaign um that we can actually make big bold structural changes to our society um if we're willing to fight for them and if we're willing to make the investments necessary um and as a organizer i think that this is one area where it takes more than just being a good city councilor or having a viewpoint on an issue um it takes coalition building um and i'm very proud to say that i've uh received the endorsements of several city councilors in Somerville, um, two state reps of Somerville, our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and I'm going to take the relationships that I've built, not only in this city, but in our region and across the state in order to fight for um, regional models for issues around housing and the environment, um, because we know that these issues can't be solved only in Somerville. We need to work with our partners to make sure that we're having clean air, clean water, um, and housing justice for all. Thank you. Thanks very much for your thoughtful responses. Now we're going to go into our second round of questions. And so Kristen Strezza, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, I will, uh, sure, I'll, I'll ask a question to Willie. Um, so, Willie, what did Summer Vision 2040 get wrong and what could it have, and what did you like about it and what could it have done better? Thank you for that question. Um, and I think it's a really important one because environmental justice for me is a huge issue as a member of the Sunrise Movement, as someone who's been endorsed by the Sunrise Movement. Um, Summer Vision 2040 has a lot of great goals. Um, there are two major issues here. Um, I think the goals deadlines have, were too far out. We need to be moving them forward because they are not in line with what the scientific community says that our country needs to actually do to meet the scale of the climate crisis. And more important than just the goals are our progress towards the goals. We've lagged on all of these goals um, from the beginning, which is why we have a summer 2040, because it's the second uh, addition of a program uh, that we were already falling behind on. So I think that we need a council that's going to be chasing these things with the urgency that they deserve and they're going to fight to make the investments we need to have cleaner air along, especially along I-93 um, and to build more equitable green space across the city. And I want to be that counselor. Thank you. Thank you. Justin, return to ask questions. Great. Uh, my question is for Virginia Hussey. So you are the only candidate for city council at large that has military service experience. And you know firsthand the struggles of veterans as they return to our community. So what can our city government do to better meet the needs of veterans in our community? Thank you for the question, Justin. Um, when I came home about 10 years ago, there actually wasn't any programs. Um, now we do have one that is in West Somerville, but I think that we need to do more. Um, you know, we have gone through a lot of veteran um like the people that are running the veteran services we've gone through a lot we need to find somebody that cares and is willing to stand up for our veterans um you know they they are doing well i've actually gone down and i've, I've visited them um, but i think that we need more programs they they train us to go overseas and do what we have to do but when we get back and we get out there's no program to get you back into civilization and in a regular normal life just paying bills and just the little things are a lot um and uh, again i had kind of struggled with that when i came home i was homeless um i didn't know what to do i didn't know what the next step was um you know where do i work what do i do i have i had a child um, and it was very complicated so we have come a long way but I believe that we can do a lot more thank you thank you you such please go ahead and ask a question sure my next one is for uh, Charlotte so uh, 
Charlotte, one of the things you talk about a lot in, um, in your materials is around public goods and how to uh, build and expand public goods. What do you mean by public goods and what do you feel like is missing in our city today? Yeah, um, to me, public goods are the things that are collectively paid for through our tax dollars and that are democratically controlled. Um, I fundamentally believe these types of goods and services that are universally accessible to our residents can transform the community that we live in. Um, particularly, I'm thinking about um, housing justice, food justice, transit justice, the services that we currently lack in our community that would radically transform our, our neighbors' lives if we actually had access to them. Um, thinking particularly about Chelsea and their food program that they uh, created from the ground up in their municipality, um, or passing fair free transit here in our city. We're going to be getting $30 million back from the Green Line Extension refund, and that money was set up to address, um, you know, the Green Line Extension was set up to address environmental racism and inadequate access to public transit. And I think part of that refund um, we should be using to invest in it, creating an opportunity to pilot fare free transit because we know that universal programs are overwhelmingly more equitable and accessible to folks. Um, and I think that's my time. Thank you. Virginia, possibly, if you could ask your last question. Yes. Um, so I'm going to ask Jake. Um, why are you running in Somerville and why now? Thanks, Virginia. My first question, a great one. Um, mostly I'm running because people came to me uh, over the last few years and encouraged me to run. It was not something that I'll admit was on my brain. Uh, basically, people saw what I had done uh, with a couple of nonprofits in the community, particularly Somerville Youth Soccer. Um, we aggressively grew the program. Uh, primarily through outreach. Uh, this is a divided city. Uh, it's, it's a segregated city and we're divided culturally. And I view soccer as a great opportunity to bring our divided community together. And we worked hard, tirelessly, to do outreach to our city's awesome immigrant community and to get those kids signed up for soccer. I put in the sweat on, on, and the hours on that. Um, and it paid off. Uh, we took an organization that was lacking in diversity, and it's now more diverse than the city of Somerville. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Willie Burnley, please go ahead and ask your question. Well, thank you. Um, I think I will ask a question to, to Eve. Um, as someone who's knocked on a lot of doors, I know that the issue of accessibility is really important to a lot of folks in our community. Um, and I think that issue only becomes more problematic for Somerville during the winter when the snow hits um, and the ice comes. Um, and I know that you are an advocate of sidewalk plowing, uh, municipal shoveling and all that good stuff. So could you tell me why that important that uh, program is important to you? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sidewalk, uh, sidewalk, municipal sidewalk plowing or sidewalk socialism, as we sometimes call it, uh, is a really important issue to me. I think that anyone um, trying to navigate the streets of Somerville, and I remember the year we got six feet of snow um, or more. And, uh, and then even as me as a, a young person trying to get around, you see the uh, big trucks speeding by and the cars and you can't get where you need to go. And if you're elderly or you're a person with disabilities, I can only imagine how marginalizing it is to try to pilot an assistive device like a wheelchair um, through the kinds of pathways that we get when we rely on uh, landlords and homeowners and uh, renters to individually clean each of their individual sidewalks, leaving paths that are just a couple feet wide. So I see this as a real opportunity to create good union jobs, um, to boost public health for seniors and people with heart conditions, and to make a more accessible city that serves people, not just cars. Thank you. Jake Wilson, please go ahead. I've got a question for Virginia. Virginia, uh, fellow Somerville Public Schools parent. Uh, it's hard raising kids uh, in this society. We don't make it easy on families. What do you see as things that this city could do to make raising kids in this city a much easier task? Well, thank you for that question. Um, and I think that's huge. And the reason why is, you know, I have a 10 year old son, but our youth is our future. Um, and, you know, we built this beautiful high school. And if we can't get housing and programs and after school programs, um, 
you know, for our children, we are not going to be able to work or we can't, um, you know, we have to find a babysitter um, like I did today because my son, there was no after school program. They were already full um, and he had been going to that program for years. And yes, the COVID had messed it up, but we don't have enough programs. We need boys and girls clubs. Um, the same as you, Jake. I am a Pop Wanna football coach and cheerleader. I have been for since I was a kid, since I graduated high school, I helped. Um, and, and I do work with a lot of our youth and they're our future. I think we need to put everything into them um, and provide more stuff for families so that they do stay in Somerville. Um, and that also comes with affordable housing. It's very hard to, to raise a child in this city. Thank you. Tracy Leah Pratt, let's go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, hmm. My question is for Virginia, actually. Virginia. Um, so as I've been going about the city, one of the things I absolutely believe is we have a small city, it's four miles um, long, but we have a huge city. Um, can you please share what you notice about the inequities from one ward to another? Let's say compare seven to one. Um, yes. Well, I see a huge difference um, with just the people, the businesses, uh, the streets. Um, you know, I, I walk my dog and I know we see each other every day walking our dogs um, and our streets are filthy. Um, just the, the, the property. We don't have that many trees or they're getting cut down, um, you know, in, in between East Somerville and West Somerville, you feel like you're in two different cities. And that's the problem with Somerville is we are so divided right now. And we need to work together so that all of us have the same opportunities across the board. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, getting out there as we are doing, going door to door and speaking to everybody. And, and what I did notice is a lot of them, you know, don't know what's going on or have no idea who's even running and, you know, asking the names. Um, so just getting out there, dealing with people and making our community all the same as one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Charlotte, help. Yeah. Um, my question's for Willie. So as a fellow renter, um, you know that Somerville residents are overwhelmingly cost burdened by the price of, of our housing. Um, myself and you and many of the renters who are on this stage feel that struggle every single day when we go and pay our rent checks. Um, and we're also watching development grow. Uh, we are one of the densest cities in the United States and we continue to develop in our community. So my question is, how would you ensure that residents can actually shape the future of Somerville, especially when we're up against big developments taking over every corner of our community? Thank you for that question, Charlotte. It's another really important one um, that I've talked to a lot of residents about, um, especially in the Union Square neighborhood, um, but all across the city. Um, there's a sense from a lot of people that developers can just come into Somerville, um, plop down their giant in many cases, life science buildings, um, and people will be displaced, people's rents will go up, um, and their quality of life will go down while the profits flow to um, private industries. Um, and I think just fundamentally, we need to be working to put the power back into the people's hands. Um, and the one great model for that that I really love and have learned from the union um, Square Neighborhood Council and Union United as community benefits agreements. Um, these are legally binding contracts that residents can put on developers to make sure that they are getting um, benefits from the kind of developments that are coming to our city. That's good jobs, that's green space, and that's community space. And we need to make sure that the people of Somerville can have their own futures determined by them and not corporate interests. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. That concludes that part of the, of the program. Thanks for your thoughtful and um, really digging deep answers and questions. It was really very interesting and illuminating. Just about everyone here has publicly spoken or has a statement on his, her, or their website speaking to essentially saying, damn, the rents are high. So no one's going to argue with that position. That would be kind of insane. But what I would like to ask 
community and to invite you to do is take 30 seconds to say, what would you do to make housing more affordable in summers? And I'm going to call you out in, in order. Thank you very much for uh, indulging me while I, I follow my script. So Tracy, Mia Pratt, affordable housing in Somerville. First of all, I believe affordable housing is not just rent, it is home ownership opportunities. I own the place where I lived and I work very hard to be able to have it. Um, one of the things I believe is education, education, education. The more we can educate renters, landlords, and future homeowners, uh, I feel that those opportunities will open up for them along with having very good, acceptable programs. We need to get creative about programming. We need to get creative about ways to lessen the amount of down payments people need for housing. Um, so I, I just don't want us to forget home ownership opportunities in this. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Charlotte Kelly. Um, there are three areas where I think we could be working really hard. I'm particularly thinking about the American Relief Plan Act money that's coming our way and the Green Line Extension Refund that's coming our way. We have to expand the Office of Housing Stability to make sure they have enough staff, resources, interpretation services to actually do their jobs and do them well. Um, we have to expand the emergency housing fund so that more folks can have access to subsidies and dollars to keep them in their homes for both renters and homeowners alike. And I think we have to get really creative about some programs that we don't currently see in Somerville and maybe even across the country. I'm thinking particularly expanding the 100 Homes program, but also expanding our first time home buyers resources for low income and working class residents, as well as thinking about that real cost burden of a first, last and security deposit that most renters experience when they're moving into our community. So what would it look like if we set up a housing stability fund, particularly for those for slots and security deposit funds because a lot of folks who may want to stay in Somerville, their unit are, is getting too expensive, can't afford that upfront cost. And ultimately, we want to keep people in our community. Thank you. Justin Flicota. So the only way to really deal with affordable housing is to actually build more affordable housing in this city. I think we've seen a lot of gimmicks in terms of trying to distort the market. And while we should have caps on excessive rent increases, the only way is to actually build the housing we've been promising for 20 years. And this point actually is very challenging, I think, for the city. And the only way for us to scale our efforts in housing is to couple it to new commercial lab space so they can generate the tax revenues we need to support the housing infrastructure, the city services, and the schools. Without that new revenue stream, we cannot deliver on our promise to make housing more affordable. And we certainly should not uh, raise taxes on homeowners just to subsidize housing infrastructure because that actually has the effect of making housing also less affordable. So the only way to tackle housing in the city, if we're serious about it, is to build more affordable housing and couple it to commercial space so we can have the tax revenues we need to pay for it. Thank you. Okay. Kristen Strezzo. Oh boy. Okay. As, as uh, already serving city councilor, I have worked extensively on uh, affordable housing. And yes, we need more home ownership opportunities for a low income residents. I agree with that. And I have fought tirelessly to expand the budget of the Office of Housing Stability and increase interpreta interpreter services and de novo uh, so that um, that our tenants, if they're facing eviction, are receiving um, a legal counsel. I've fought hard to make sure that that has been expanded already in the budget. I've already been doing the work on this. I'm delighted to say. We also need to increase the um, housing stock of three and four bedroom units, which we are not doing. And we need to. We need to do that decades ago. We need to, I believe in the summer VIP program, which expands the, the section eight program of both um, what, uh, so, so residents can stay in our community. That service is already in place. We already have a lot of great services already in place and we're working hard to continue on the work. I'm so excited to do this alongside you. Thank you. Eve, such a 
Yeah, so let's not mince words, right? The market has completely failed to provide housing at a reasonable cost for Somerville renters and homeowners. It's just a huge problem, and it's not going to be easy to get out of it. And we're going to need to go beyond the measures that we've taken over the last couple decades, where our city government has overseen this housing crisis and has been unable to change the direction of the city. I think at the end of the day, the research shows we need thousands of new affordable units in the next 10 years, and that's a daunting prospect. Uh, but I will will tell you, as I think Councillor J.T. Scott said, we can't get out of a family car shortage by building hundreds of Ferraris. We have to actually build affordable units. And that means using the leverage that the community has to pressure for-profit developers uh, to build as much affordable housing as possible, accessible housing, multi-bedroom units for families, um, using tools like the community benefit agreements and overlay districts, but also fighting for rent control at the state level and using that uh, once in perhaps a decade opportunity of using ARPA funding and Green Line extension funding uh, to bond that and build social housing outside the market. Thank you. Virginia Huss. Yes. Um, so somebody, as somebody who has gone through um, the affordable housing, I will say that the process is daunting. I was on a waiting list for years um, and bouncing couch to couch. It, it was, you know, it was very hard. And without the support, I don't even know where I would be, to be honest with you. So what I would say is, you know, we need to work with these developers, even if we make, you know, the percent, say 25 percent affordable housing, 30 percent, um, you know, let's give back to the people and make more affordable housing. Like my, like they said, three, four bedrooms, you know, you're not seeing that. We need more of it so that our kids can stay here. So some of them can have families, um, not just students or, you know, one bedrooms um, so that our families can stay here and actually afford it and I think we need to um, you know work with our owners and let them know and get rid of the stigma from affordable housing and having a voucher because I faced that a lot in the years and I think by working with them and letting them know and we'll be able to do it okay we'll be for Thank you for the question. I'm glad that a lot of the, the candidates here know that there are many different ways to affect this issue. Um, and I'd like to talk about some that we haven't talked about, including working with our Somerville Community Land Trust, which is working to build or acquire permanently affordable and accessible housing. And as someone who's organized with that group, I know that there are people in Somerville right now that are willing to literally donate their homes to that organization so that they can remain affordable in perpetuity, which is incredibly important because the market will not solve this. But we also need to um, work on our zoning, increase density in different areas, build up height. Um, and we also need to be making sure that, um, especially folks who are on fixed incomes, particularly seniors um, and people with disabilities, um, have support from the city, um, are able to access funding from the city in order to stay in their homes because we should not be kicking um, seniors who've lived here for decades out of their homes or having them live in fear that the next bill that comes, they might have to leave and sell their house or flip it into a condo. Thank you. Jake Wilson. Thanks. Uh, rent control is getting a lot of talk uh, tonight in general uh, in, in this election. It's worth the fight, you know, proper simple caps on annual uh, rent increases on returning renters. Great idea. It faces a long uphill battle at the state level. I think it got 13 votes in the House when it came up last time. That doesn't mean we should sit around waiting for rent control to happen. There's stuff we can do here. Uh, single biggest thing is, is try to incentivize landlords to keep the rents reasonable. Uh, my, uh, my proposal basically ties a rental property's assessment to the price they're charging for rent. If a landlord chooses to spike the rent on the, on the tenants there, their assessment would go way up. They keep it reasonable, it stays down. Reward landlords for being good landlords. Uh, and then like others have talked about, we gotta build, build, build. You know, Willie's correct. You know, if, if we can incentivize developers to build the kind of housing we need here, middle class and low income housing, do it ourselves. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Another group of thoughtful, actionable recommendations. This has been great. And now we're heading into the end part of this and we have our opening statement. We had our opening statements. Now we have our closing statements. Each candidate will be asked to make a one minute closing statement. And just because we're elegant, we're going to go and reverse the order from our opening statements. So, Jake Wilson. 
So I'd like to ask Justin to speak first. So Somerville is facing historic challenges of the pandemic and the climate crisis. As a climate advocate, vaccine researcher, and your Democratic State Commitment, I have the experience we need to help Somerville meet these challenges. With so much opportunity ahead of us, it's important to know what's at stake in this election. I have three opponents who have all pledged to Boston DSA, not just to defund, but to abolish our police force. And if they have their way, we will miss our opportunity to build a healthier, greener, safer, and more prosperous Somerville. With your support, we can elect fair-minded, experienced progressives to Somerville City Council who support common sense reforms and will help build a healthier, greener future. To make that future a reality, I ask for your vote November 2nd. Thank you, and may God bless Somerville. Kristen Strezer. Thank you. So uh, I'm Councilor Kristen Strezzo, already serving as your at-large counselor. She's a thrill of my life. I love our community. And we've done so much work together, and I'm committed to continuing on the work alongside you. So I've been fighting for accessibility, equity, and affordability since day one, even before a city councilor. And I'm committed to us thriving together. And I'm, I'm proud to be serving us. And remember that this is a pivotal election year. Experience matters. My experience on the council matters. And I'm going to be helping us guide us forward into the years ahead, continuing on the work together. We need someone who listens to everyone and can work across the spectrum of Somerville. I have a broad coalition of support and trust that spans a diverse Somerville res residence endorsements, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, the Bay State Stonewall Dems, nine unions have endorsed me, the Mass Women's Political Caucus, so much more. I'm just getting started alongside you. This is about all of us as a community. Reach out to me. I want to hear from you, and I'm asking for your vote this November 2nd. Charlotte Kelly. As a fourth generation resident and as a young person, I know the pain and struggle of trying to stay in this community. Um, I'm watching my young community be really unaffordable uh, to stay in this community. Um, and I'm also one of the last people in my family here in Somerville. And every time we lose someone because jobs don't pay enough to live here, our rents go up, um, and we struggle to have the services that meet our needs, we should grieve that. Um, but we also need to fight to make sure we can keep people in our communities. Um, I am deeply committed to building the kind of affordable and public housing that meets the needs of our residents. Um, I am so excited to build the kind of infrastructure that allows all of us to get safely around Somerville. And I'm deeply, deeply committed to fighting for the kind of public goods and public services that get to the root of our neighbors' problems, rather than criminalizing, stigmatizing, and policing our neighbors for their needs. We have an opportunity to transform our community here in Somerville, and I'm really excited to build a city that works for all of us with many of the people on this stage and all of the voters who live in our beautiful and vibrant city. Thanks. Tracy Leah Pratt. Yes, again, I'm th Tracy Leah Pratt. Thank you so much. I am asking for one of your four votes for counselor at large. I have been against defunding the police since I entered this race. I have spoken to people in the community, the most vulnerable people, and they want policing in their neighborhoods. They feel safe. I am running for office because my voice matters. What I think matters. I have been working with students in Somerville. I've been working with parents with Somerville all over the last 11 years. I'm here, I have a voice, my voice matters, and I respectfully ask for your vote on November 2nd. Jake Wilson. Thanks. Uh, this pandemic has been really rough on everyone, especially this city. Uh, I thought it's really shown a spotlight on uh, a lot of the big problems. They've been there all along, but they're increasingly difficult to ignore. Uh, so we have an opportunity now. Now that we've been presented with these, do we forget about these and move on with our lives as the pandemic eventually recedes, or do we have the courage to go face these and take them on? And, you know, I've, I've watched, you know, my, my kids go to the Healy school. Uh, I, I, the families I know there, I, I know what they face. Uh, and I've seen how they've suffered during this time. And we need to be doing everything we can to address these big issues out there. Uh, like we've talked about tonight, affordability, equity, uh, 
you know, all just the, the basic, the basic services of the city. I will fight for you. I will, I will work to solve problems. And I ask for one of your votes on November 2nd. Thank you. Really Burnley. Thank you. We face a potentially transformative juncture in this election this year. Um, and I got into this race knowing that. I got into it knowing that our city can do better when it comes to being affordable, accessible, and accountable to all of our residents. Um, and as I've knocked on thousands of doors across this city, I've had the, the joy and the opportunity to meet so many people who share a, my vision for this community, a vision where we can all live together um, without being displaced. Um, and these people understand um, how deep these issues go, and they are not afraid of the fear mongering that happens from, by political actors to try to stop them from accessing their power. Mm. Um, I'm proud to say that we've built a, a movement that is trying to shatter a status quo that wasn't working for working people. And if you want to join that movement, you should join me at willieforsummervote.com. Uh, and I ask you for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Virginia Hussey. So again, I am a third generation. Um, my son is the fourth generation. Um, and I've been working with the most vulnerable for the last 15, 20 years. Um, and even before that, as a kid, this is where I grew up. The, this program of the Papuana program does so much for our vulnerable kids. Um, there are some that I coached 15 years ago that I still deal with today. And they hit me up and they're like, you know what, coach, you, you know, you were the person that opened my eyes. Um, some of them have, you know, single parents, so they couldn't come to the games. I'd have to drive them to the games. Um, so I've been working a lot in this community. Again, as a union member, um, I've gotten endorsed by the Greater Boston Labor Council and multiple unions, um, obviously, including my own. And I'm one of you. And I want to be that voice. I've been fighting my whole life to get where I'm at today, and I wouldn't change anything. So I want you to know that I will continue fighting on a bigger platform for all of Somerville. Thank you. And vote on November 2nd for me. All right, thank you so much for taking the time to tune into this debate today. I completely agree with others who have said that this is a pivotal, potentially transformative moment for Somerville uh, with uh, the change in our mayor and also the open seats on city council to take our city in a bold new direction. And I would encourage you to listen carefully to what you've said, heard today and think about what, uh, what your vote could do uh, to bring about a future that puts, uh, makes a Somerville that puts people before profit. Um, you know, I, uh, one of the shootings this summer, uh, was over rent money, right? That's a social failure that we all collectively bear because in the richest country in the history of the world, the poverty that exists in our community is a policy choice. Mm -hmm. And we need to fight every day to help the people who are at the margins, who are marginalized, transgender people like me, people of color, um, poor and working people. And we need to put them first. And that means going beyond the policies of the past to a bold future where we have solutions that meet the scale of the issues facing our community today. So I'm going to ask for one of your four at-large votes on November 2nd. Thank you. Heartfelt thanks to all of the candidates for your thoughts, your feelings, your passion, your commitment. It's an important election. There's no doubt about it. Thanks, and please vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.